Before I hand over, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Duncan Edwards was at Merchant Taylor's School from 1977 to 1981. And from here, he went on to Sheffield University to read geography and politics. He's current president of the OMT Society. Indeed, Duncan is the first OMT to hold the presidency for two consecutive years, having had the good fortune of taking up the office on the eve of the pandemic. Duncan is also the chief executive of British American Business, the leading transatlantic trade organization of some 450 companies. It has an ongoing mission to support policies which protect and enhance the environment for trade and investment in and between the UK and the US. Prior to this, he spent 30 years as a media executive in London and New York, including 27 years at the Hearst Corporation, who are publishers of titles such as Cosmopolitan, Elle and Harper's Bazaar where his most recent role was president and CEO of the, an internet, of the international magazine and digital media company. Duncan is a British citizen and he currently lives in New York and also Connecticut, where he can often be found on long, long runs in the hills, although I suspect not quite now because I gather it's quite snowy. Anyway, over to you, Duncan, and thank you very much. Well, thanks, Emma, and thank you for that. Um that very full introduction and uh, it's really a pleasure to be um, with you all today. Um, very exciting day for me today because I had my vaccine so uh, this particular uh, I, I'm, I'm, I live in both Connecticut and in New York State and uh, Connecticut opened it up to the over 55s at the beginning of March and uh, so Sarah and I managed to get our vaccines uh, this morning our first dose this morning so all, all very exciting. Um, yeah, so I suppose just to, just to add a uh, another word or two about um, the context in which I'm going to be speaking. Um, I have um, been, I basically worked for American organizations most of my career, and I've had the I've had the uh, experience of both being a a country manager and CEO in the UK, where my role was pitching for capital and resources from the head office and making the case why investing in the UK would, was a good idea. And then I've also had the role actually at head office as a, as a board member of, of the company, making uh, resource allocation decisions and looking at the opportunity of the UK as a place to invest versus other markets around the world. So um, it's, uh, I think it's given me a good perspective on, on what makes the, the, the UK an interesting uh, and relevant place for US companies and what their attitude towards it is. Um, the other part of, my, of the context I think that's relevant is I've lived here in the US now for 12 years. So uh, inev inevitably as a kind of politically curious person, you end up absorbing um, quite a lot of the kind of cultural issues that are that are going on in this market, and and clearly uh, I bring those uh, to what I'm going to say today, uh, and all, of course to my professional life as the CEO of a, of a uh, important trade association. Um, so maybe I'll start at the end um, and and actually say that I think the relationship between the US and the UK is incredibly strong. And look, I, I know uh, before the election uh, here in the US, there were some comments about the perceived relationship between Boris Johnson and Donald Trump and how that would play with uh, Joe Biden and, and that this would be a problem for the UK. Um, but there really isn't any uh, uh, Biden, uh, Boris, uh, feud, um, you know. I think it was, I think it was very important and very significant that the first call uh, that uh, Biden ended up making to a foreign um, leader was to the to the uh, UK. Um, the first visit of a cabinet-ranking uh, member of the administration was to the UK, which was. Uh, 
which was last week when John Kerry visited the UK. He then did go on to Brussels, but he started in the UK. Um, and I, you know, I just, I just think that was any, any of those stories were nonsense. And um, you know, the U, the US continues to see the UK as the most important uh, strategic strategic partner that it has. And the reason for this is is really all about uh, security um, and intelligence and the security and intelligence partnership that exists between the US and the UK uh, is deeper than between any two um, sovereigns. Um, they are, the US and the UK are the cornerstones of the Five Eyes uh, Intelligence Partnership, which is uh, the US, UK plus Canada, Australia um, and New Zealand. But really the capabilities for that intelligence partnership rest with both the US and the UK. Um, the UK, UK intelligence uh, team and military team still are the only country in the world that are uh, allowed unaccompanied access into the Pentagon. And there's a whole range of other privileges that the UK has in its relationship with the US. And so at the heart of this special relationship, and it's pragmatic, isn't it? It's, it, it's, it's because of this security and intelligence relationship. Um, it's, and we'll talk about this hopefully a little bit later. This is why the, um, the UK's uh, recent announcement about further investment in um, capabilities in uh, military intelligence and cybersecurity in this kind of area is so important. And assets like GCHQ um, are these kind of world-class assets that the UK has are so important to its partnership with the US. And, and this, this partnership, this relationship, this military intelligence relationship, security relationship tends to transcend the changes in political leadership that happen in either country, uh, even one uh, as what, what feels like as, as, as um, startling or as marked uh, in terms of contrast between, um, between Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden. So kind of that's the conclusion, but let me go back and what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes talking about what I think is the, is likely to be the, um, the priorities for the Biden administration. So the domestic priorities uh, for the administration, the foreign policy priorities, um, then talk a little bit about the, the UK's foreign policy priorities. And then finally think, talk about how those two mesh together and the, um, the, what that means for US UK relationship and the opportunities and challenges that exist in that, in that relationship. Um, and yes, I, I think the best thing is if we make this as discursive as possible. So I'll, I'll probably talk for 10 minutes or so now, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. And uh, I think you can shoot those questions to uh, Dominic and Cardo, or you can, or I'll keep an eye on the chat as well, by the way. So if you want to send something to me, I'll see that. Um, so this is just thinking about the Biden agenda. And um, yeah, first of all, the, 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 the agenda and the, the, um, the political equity and the polit political power and capital that Biden has to, to use is going to be substantially used domestically. Um, the, you know, the priorities for the administration, unsurprisingly, are going to be at home uh, rather than uh, uh, abroad. And uh, it's very rare, except perhaps in times of, of war, that foreign policy issues are going to win uh, elections. And every political leader in the US, as soon as they're appointed, is focused on the next election. So the priority is going to be what happens within the United States. Um, and within that, I think the... Um, ongoing recovery from the COVID crisis, but from a healthcare perspective, which fortunately seems to be going well, uh, but also from an economic perspective are going to be the number one priority. Um, you saw that with the uh, huge bill that was put through, uh, that was signed into law on Friday last week, a massive $1.9 trillion stimulus package 
um, which had a whole range of components in it, but was really about getting the 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 getting through the health crisis and getting the economy back uh, thrumming and uh, working uh, as it was before the crisis. So COVID and the recovery will be the number one priority. The next priority is this concept that's being called equity here, um, which is a combination of equality. Uh, I guess it's, it's the equivalent of the leveling up agenda in the UK. And this is about um, a, a, a classic Democrat, um, a progressive politics position, which is about trying to address politic policies towards those people in the community here have, that have somehow been left behind by what has been you know, the, the ongoing um, success of the, of the US economy. And a lot of that is about, uh, in the UK, obviously it's about you know, more regional, more geographic. In, in, the, in the US, it's more about communities of people, particularly uh, defined by race. Uh, so there is a lot of emphasis in the administration on equity. Um, other things that are going to be important to the Biden administration, healthcare, um, trying to shore up and defend the Affordable Care Act, uh, which opened up affordable health care to more Americans. And they'll try throughout the, um, the next four years to put more bulwarks around that to cement it in place. Um, there'll be an, a, 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 a sort of an underlying current of, of thinking about labor market issues. Uh, typically from a Democrat uh, administration wanting to um, help the, the, uh, the organized uh, labor and uh, uh, you know, working class uh, uh, roles, what they call middle class roles here. Um, climate will be very much back on the agenda. Uh, John Kerry has been appointed as the kind of climate czar. So everything that every every policy that the administration looks at will be reviewed through a climate lens. Um, there'll also be some sub themes going on here. Um, there'll be a tax bill will be attempted uh, to be introduced and which will see uh, tax increases across the board, but particularly a reversal. Not all the way, but some of the way of the um, of the uh, uh, job uh, the the tax cuts and jobs act of four years ago so that that will mean an increase in corporation tax uh, an increase in the higher rate of personal income tax an increase on, in tax on capital gains for individuals um, those will be the main uh, parts of that um, there'll be there'll be an attempt to introduce a enormous infrastructure bill which is desperately needed anybody who's been to the states recently will know that the bridges and roads and uh, are all falling apart and there's a desperate need to rebuild america um, there's there's talk of anything up anything between a 2 and 4 trillion dollar infrastructure bill i mean these numbers are just uh, insane um, and whether he likes it or not, there'll, there'll be um, immigration issues will also be uh, on the agenda uh, for this administration. And clearly they would have liked to have done that in a controlled way, but it, it looks like a crisis is brewing on the southern border of the states, uh, which is gonna need addressing uh, more quickly than um, perhaps the administration would have liked. So those will be the big uh, domestic issues, but. Um, domestically, everything's going to be a real fight. Um, the, the result of the election um, that put uh, Biden in the White House uh, ended up with a, uh, a tie in the Senate. So there are effectively 50, I think there's one um, independent, but they vote with, their, with the, 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 the Democrat caucus. So there's effectively 50-50 um, um, Republican uh, Democrats in the, in the Senate who have to approve bills. And uh, that means that the vice president, Kamala Harris, is the tiebreaker. She has the tiebreaker vote. But it, it only therefore takes one Democrat to vote the other way or abstain for this to be a problem in getting bills through. And there are some very there are some centralist uh, Democrats who you know, uh, are in uh, kind of red states that red you know, it's the other way around here in the US, of course, red and blue. Um, which means it's very difficult to guarantee that 
that uh, legislation is going to get through. There is a system of getting it through called reconciliation. That's how the, the, the bill got through last week, which is reserved for finance bills only and can only be used twice a year. Um, so it, it's really tough. Um, the, the, the Democrats actually lost seats in the House of Representatives. They didn't gain seats at the election. And so they're worried about um, the midterms and the Republicans are confident that they will gain seats again in two years to 18 months time. Um, and, uh, you know, I think everyone knows there's a, a pretty um, polemic po a political environment here. The, uh, the, uh, the, both the left and the right are kind of getting further from the center. So uh, it, it's, there's not a lot of middle ground at the moment in US politics. On foreign policy, um, listen, American foreign, foreign policy will continue to be dominated by China. Um, this is the, uh, the big strategic competitor as a, both as a economic power, but also as a sort of vision for um, how countries should be governed. Um, that is a bipartisan issue. So anybody who thought that Biden would have a different approach to China, a softer approach to China after Trump, that is not going to happen. In fact, Biden throughout the campaign um, accused Donald Trump of being soft on China, uh, particularly on trade, uh, but also on human rights issues um, and not without reason. Uh, there is you know, huge problems in China and we could talk a bit more about that if you like, because I think it's going to cause a, a, a big issue between uh, the US and Europe as, as Europe is, is forced to decide, is, is to pick a side. Um, so China will be hugely dominating um, trade issues, currency issues, human rights issues, all, all the things that we know about. Um, on a more um, a positive note, I suppose, um, foreign policy here, there'll be a re-engagement with the multilater multilateral institutions. So uh, um, uh, Biden's already rejoined the um, Paris Accord on climate. He's rejoined the WHO. Um, he has uh, indicated that he'll participate in some of the UN institutions, which the US had withdrawn from. Um, yeah, and will you know, be a bit more vocal about support for NATO um, and so on. Um, but, the, but the suspicion that exists in the US about you know, supranational organizations won't go away. So the US is naturally a bit iffy about the UN, about because it's become so politicized, of course, about the WTO, not without reason, about the WHO, not without reason. And you know, conti will con this administration will continue to ask NATO members to contribute, you know, to pay the two percent of or to spend two percent of GDP on defense, which is what they're meant to do, and that Trump, of course, highlighted. Um, so I don't think there's been much change on the on the actual foreign policy issues, uh, but there'll be a change in how they're presented. So not much change in substance, but a lot of change in in presentation style from, from Biden. Other problems I think that everyone knows, Russia continues to be a massive problem for the US um, and, uh, uh, and for others. Uh, Iran, it looks like there'll they'll, they'll be an attempt at a reset uh, with Iran. And you know, Biden, had, Biden talked about rejoining the JCPOA. I think that's very unlikely, um, but we'll see. And then there's always North Korea. Um, one key difference will be climate. Um, so they, I think the, the US will, having rejoined the Paris Accords, will be enthusiastic um, uh, advocates for um, you know, changes in, uh, in carbon consumption. Um, I think it's very likely they'll send a big delegation to, to COP26 in Glasgow in November. Um, and I think John Kerry will be very energetic around the world. Um, the, 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 the fifth point on foreign policy, and it's probably fifth in importance for the US as well, will be kind of what happens to trade with 
uh, the UK and the EU and other trade deals. I just, unfortunately, I just don't think trade agreements are going to be high on the priority list for the uh, US administration. And happy to talk more about that, something that we've been very involved with as in, as in my professional life. Um, just on the U UK foreign policy priorities, well, it, the timing is good for this talk because uh, yesterday or the day before, um, the UK government published a very extensive uh, report on its approach to foreign policy, which I have here printed out. It's available on the on the gov HM government's website. It's called Global Britain in a Competitive Age, and it sets out the kind of vision for how the, the UK will approach um, foreign policy. And it's what it's trying to do is combine or take an integrated view of foreign policy, defence policy, uh, overseas aid, and kind of economic activity or trade. Um, and it's worth a read. Anybody interested in uh, U UK foreign policy, it's, it's an easy read and it's, um, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting because it's um, very clear what the UK wants to try to do. Um, you know, it starts by investing more in defence, um, uh, which the UK has announced, uh, this massive increase in defence spending, but that's, that's gonna be particularly targeted at technology. So cybersecurity, um, AI, you know, GCHQ, all that kind of uh, military intelligence. So spend money on things that will matter in the future, space war, that kind of stuff, rather than things that mattered in the past. So defense investment is gonna be critical for the UK. Uh, they're also gonna spend a lot of money on trying to make the UK a science and technology superpower. Uh, I think the UK has seen the impact of its, for example, its world leadership in um, sequencing genomes means that more than, you know, when we've been going through this crisis, the identification of the new strains of the uh, coronavirus, more than 50% of the world's genomic tests on the virus actually happen in the UK. And they're the, they're the best in the world at doing it. So a lot of um, investment in science and technology the UK also wants to use what it considers its strong soft power base um, to project values uh, around the world where it may not have the, you know, the, the biggest kind of club anymore, the biggest you know, stick to beat people with anymore. It feels it has a lot of influence to shape uh, how the world looks and feels and thinks. They talk about the BBC, I mean, ironically, for maybe for some people, but they talk about the BBC, British Council, the very big and skillful diplomatic cadre that exists around the world and so on. Um, and they, the UK is committed to uh, being a leader in climate action. So that's what the UK is thinking about. So what does that mean for the US and the UK? Um, well, I think it's very smart of the UK to invest in defence. The, 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 the US, you know, when it's thinking about who its allies and partners are, it wants to, it wants to think that people are putting money on the table in, the, the, in a way that can be helpful to them. And so I think that will reinforce the security and intelligence partnership that really is the thing that underpins everything else. Uh, so I think that's smart. Um, but the US is also going to look around for partners and allies on the big foreign policy problems that it's got, particularly China. Um, you know, it's not clear that the where the UK will come. I think, well, I think it is much clearer than it was. Um, you know, with the, the UK last year made a decision, for example, to uh, remove Huawei as a supplier from the telecoms infrastructure. Um, which was I think, seen as absolutely essential for the U.S. relationship. Um, so there'll be a few other points of tension, I think, where the U.S. will say, you know, who's, you know, you know are, are you with us or not uh, on issues around China? And I, I suspect those will come on, you know, sanctions for what's happening uh, with the Uyghurs, um, a question about what's happening with Hong Kong. And democracy in Hong Kong and uh, it, it feels you know other people may have different views on this and please say if you do it feels like 
the UK is, is more increasingly lining up with the US on these issues around China, on human rights issues and uh, the egregious approach to um, trade. Um, then there's Russia. And again, there's a question about, you know, who's going to be the partners with the US on Russia? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the EU seems to try to ride two horses on Russia with you know, the, the pipeline into Germany, Nord Stream 2, uh, and feel unwilling to condemn Russia because of the trade issues, as they do on China, to be honest. Um, perhaps the other way around, you know, the UK is going to try and persuade um, the US on Iran that they, that they need to come back into the alliance, uh, although, you know, Maybe Iran has moved too far away from its its obligations to get that back. Um, anyway, I, my my sense is that the UK will, as it usually does, um, position itself as a partner on on the big issues to the US. In in general, the US and the UK tend to see the thing these things in broadly similar way, um, and we'll see. Um, of course. One final point, and then I'll I'll shut up. So I've spoken a bit longer than I thought, but you know, the UK and the US were, or well, the UK in particular, was very keen to uh, ink a trade agreement. Um, was working on this very hard in the um, six or seven months leading up to the election last year. Here, um, they made a lot of progress. We we were very involved in that and they made a lot of progress but they didn't get to the point where an agreement could be signed um the the uk uh, is desperate to get that done um you know there are you know from an optics but from how it looks perspective they are absolutely desperate to try and get this agreement done um for, for various reasons which, which i'm happy to talk about it i think it's unlikely that anything will get done in the short term um, so I think we may end up, um, you know, disappointed in the UK on the, on the trade front. Um, having said that, you know, the, the, the trade and investment relationship between the US and the UK is huge and is working pretty well anyway. So the, the marginal, the marginal benefit of a trade agreement was probably being slightly overstated anyway. So anyway, with that, I will pause and hopefully raised a few uh, thoughts that um, people may have questions about. Um, I just say thank you for such a fascinating breakdown in the next four years. Um, I thought I would start by just going slightly off the topic of the main context of the talk. I wanted to ask, are there any particularly memorable teachers at Merchant Taylors or favourite subjects and activities from your time at Taylors? And perhaps further, were there any experiences that in some small way influenced your choice of future career? Wow, well, I wasn't really expecting to have to think about that, but um, let, me, let me do that off the, off the top of my head. Look, I, um, you know, it's interesting. The theme, the themes, if, if, if my uh, year as president of the OMT Society had been a normal year where I would go around the country making speeches, um, uh, I, the themes that I would have talked about uh, would have been the two constant companions of my life, which have been curiosity and enthusiasm. And you know what I what I when I was at Merchant Taylors, I, <laughs> I indulged both of those um, in any way I could. So I, I jumped into everything, and the the beauty of places like Merchant Taylors and schools like, like it, is that you can, and you, know, you are encouraged to do so. So you know, I was there for four years. I mean, I was, I was in and out, you know, arrived in the divisions, left, in those days you did O levels after two years and A levels after two years and were gone. So I left you know, just shortly after my 17th birthday. Um, and, but look, I, you know, I was in the choir, in the orchestra, in the concert band. I acted in school plays. I played team sports. I, I somehow I went on the tall ships race as a, you know, which through the, through the school. I went climbing in the Alps. I, you know, it, honestly, I was, I, yeah, everything except focusing on academic study, to be honest. And, 
you know, I had a lot of, I had a lot of, you know, you know, teachers that I was, I, I was close to. I was a scout. I know there's no scout group there anymore. Um, um, Bob Buttermore was a great, um, uh, became a great friend uh, who uh, was very involved in the scouts and the venture scouts in particular. Jeff Colley, who uh, uh, was a, uh, a great PE teacher along with John Pallant. Um, uh, we had a, we had an uh, undefeated uh, rugby team at under 15s and uh, Colts, uh, Colts level, which uh, I played in, um, which was fantastic. And uh, there, were, there were lots. And uh, yeah, Jockstein, uh, when I, I, I took a, a, a big role in one of the school plays, musical plays, and uh, John Steen was the, uh, was the uh, director of that. So yeah, there were a few. Did I miss the second part to your question, Dominic? Did I, was there? No, I think that, that was more than enough, thank you. That was, <laughs> um, so we spend quite a lot of time in our political discourse um, talking about the technicalities of tariff schedules and the in intricacies of international standards, but um, being able to speak the same language is also um, quite important when you're selling a deal. So. Um, do you think that people sometimes undervalue the sort of culture factor when it comes to trade? Yes, I do, actually. Um, yeah, I, and it's it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good philosophical debate, isn't it, to think about is, is the common language or, or very similar language um, the, the thing that, you know, the thing that drives the commonality of cultural um, associations as well and you know there's a couple of reasons why the relationship I mean multiple reasons why the relationship between the US and the UK tends to be so strong and 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 the other members of the Anglosphere as well um, uh, and language is definitely one um, the the common law legal system is another uh, which sets us apart sets the US UK Australia New Zealand apart Canada apart from the different approach to um, uh, creating law in Europe um, no, I think there's been a it wasn't always thus of course but there's been a general um, belief in the benefits of trade um, and by the way it's not a given you know because there are plenty of pressure groups and NGOs and special interest groups that don't think that trade is a good thing, you know, that, that try to reduce international trade. And, you know, there, there are some, there are some challenges. We know there are some challenges, you know, if you, if it's cheaper to make something somewhere else, then the consumers who ultimately when that's imported benefit from that. But if that means a factory has been closed down in a particular town that used to make that, that good, then in the short term, it feels like a big sacrifice. And so, and, you know, those were the issues really that Trump was focusing on when he got elected. You know, the fact that a factory may have been moved from you know, Indiana to Mexico because it was cheaper to make the refrigerators there. Um, you know, so everybody benefits from cheaper fridges, but the people who worked in the factory have lost their jobs. And that was the issue that he was focusing on. And that's the that's the challenge that people who believe in trade as a force for good, which I certainly do, because the evidence is overwhelming. Um, we, we, we keep having to make the cuts. Um, yeah, it's very interesting, the, yeah, the, because people, there has been some speculation that Biden will pivot towards a trade deal with the EU as a, in preference. Um, you know, this is stretching your question a little bit, but they don't speak the same language and they also don't view trade in the same way. And I, I think that's fanciful. I think the the last 40 years have shown that trying to get agreement between the EU and the US on trade is an extremely difficult thing to do. Um, so I, I am not holding my breath on that. Um, I thought I would just come in with some more speculation about Biden. Um, one of his campaign promises was the Build, Build Back Better initiative, uh, spending of up to three trillion, and as you said, partially funded by the reversal of Trump administration corporation tax cuts. 
do you see that policy of demanding more from corporate America as compatible with a strong economic recovery from COVID for the US? Not really, no. I mean, I, 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 I'm not a big fan of high levels of corporation tax. Um, I, um, I mean, I think, I think the, the change that was introduced four years ago was desperately needed. You know, US corporation tax levels were up over 30% and had got out of line with international norms. And that's why you were seeing US companies doing what were called tax inversions and, um, you know, relocating their, their legal base into, particularly into Ireland, but into other places as well. And, um, and with all the, all the problems that that caused. And so I, I think it was right to bring corporation tax levels back into, in the US back into line uh, with the more, with the, with the likely alternative choices. Um, now that didn't, that didn't mean bringing them down to sort of 13% kind of level um, my guess, by the way, is that you won't see a corporation tax rise back over the 30% level. I think it was interesting. I thought in the in the UK budget, um, uh, Sunak kind of flagged an increase in corporation tax with a two year delay. And I think there was a the, I think there was a strong sense that he thought, well, US taxes are also going to go up. So there won't be a reverse arbitrage issue, uh, which would 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 potentially be a problem, if um, so long as so long as corporation tax rates in the UK are lower than they are in the US, then locating an entity in the UK from the US isn't a problem. If it's the other way around, then people will start thinking about it. Um, so look, in general, I'm not a big fan of um, um, uh, corporation tax. Um, but tax has to be raised, I think, um, even though, you know, there'll be a huge amount of borrowing done as well. Um, the US can borrow almost as much as it wants. And uh, so they'll borrow a lot. Um, I mean, there are some other parts of the US tax code, which I think are insane, but um, corporation tax rates, I think, should remain competitive globally. Um, you briefly mentioned the EU, and given that for 40 years of our um, membership um, within it, the UK was a supportive and Atlanticist voice, voice in the councils of Europe, um, amplifying the US's liberal open market instincts. Um, to what extent do you think, would you fear that Brexit has now, in a sense, disintermediated uh, the UK's role as a bridge between Europe and the Anglosphere more generally, perhaps? Well, we'll see. Um, look, I think I think I thought you were going to go somewhere else with that question. Let me answer the question I thought you were going to ask, and then I'll answer the question you did ask. So, I mean, I, I think that the EU, you know, the fact that the UK has gone, is not a great thing for the EU itself because the 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 UK was that voice, that kind of liberal, pro market, Atlanticist voice inside the EU and you know that there were other you know there were other important uh, countries that shared that not all the time but some of the time Holland uh, in particular Poland and others you know Poland's got its own challenges of course but so I you know I think I think the natural instinct therefore of the EU will be, will be to become more statist less liberal and um, yeah, more dirigees. So I, I, I am. I, I, I think that's not good for the EU. Yeah, I think as far as the, whether the UK's role, this, this I think is what this document that the government has published is sets out. It's all to play for, isn't it? One we will see. I mean, clearly, you know, when you think about you know just business, you know, one of the reasons why US companies and not just US but other companies around the world chose the UK as the place that they would put their European uh, investment, usually their, particularly their head offices and so on. Um, one of the reasons was because of that link into Europe in a kind of reasonably friction-free uh, environment. And some of that has definitely gone. Um, I mean, hopefully with once the, once the new TCA agreement settles down, you know, trade will flow again 
Um, it's not, it, it's, it's a bit sticky at the moment. Um, but uh, I think those things will settle down. Um, but I think that we will see. Um, we, we will definitely see whether, certainly the vision is to try to create a sh an influencing role globally for the UK. Uh, they can't, they can't, they, 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 they can't. The UK can't, isn't big enough now to kind of define how the world looks. Um, but they might be able to sh kind of influence how the world looks. And I think that's the, uh, the role that they want to play. Um, thank you for your answers. I think we'll now open it up to the floor. Um, so we have a question from uh, Chris Daniels. Um, if you want to unmute yourself. I can read, I can see what Chris's question is if he can't unmute and talk live. I, I, I can unmute, but I switched, I switched pretty much everything off to sort of stay silent. Um, so I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you read it out. It's probably easy. I've also got Bertie Daniels in the background who wanted to say. Yes, okay, okay. Well, so <laughs> I'll save his embarrassment. Okay, so Chris's question is, this all sounds a very positive view of the UK, but what are your views on the thesis that Britain suffers from a delusion of its importance and it isn't really a top 10 global nation anymore and it will decline alongside the inevitable US decline over the coming years as global influence heads to Asia? Well, I probably am a bit more optimistic than you are from your, for it sounds from your question, but, you know, I suppose, look, from the facts, um, the UK is what is the fifth largest economy in the world um, at the moment. Um, US is the largest economy in the world. Um, you know, I know using um, purchasing power uh, parity. You know, China is really closing in on the US, on the US, but it's still, in, you know, in kind of uh, real terms, the largest. Um, and you know the US, UK, you know, the, the UK continues to have a seat at the Security Council. Is a nuclear power for whatever that's worth. Has you know the, the, the two countries that um, uh, migrants uh, want to uh, enter in order are number one the US number two, the UK. And there are, there are reasons for that because they're attractive places to live. They're attractive places to be. Um, but I, but I, I can't, so I, I kind of refute this kind of declinist view of, of the UK. It's still a, you know, a big and important country economically and um, from an influence perspective. But having said that, I think it's completely right that it's not a superpower. I mean, it's just not a superpower. And as the answer to my earlier question, to the earlier question was, I don't think it does have this ability to absolutely define, you know, what the kind of the supranational order looks like. And so therefore it's got to find a way of kind of shaping it instead through influence and you know, through using soft power, using its its uh, diplomatic cadre around the world. Uh, you know, we'll see whether lining up, you know, the, 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 the foreign aid budget has been uh, maintained at 0.7% in the UK, and I think that's a very good thing. Um, not everyone agrees in the UK, of course, but I think these things matter. We'll see whether lining that up, that foreign aid budget with, with foreign policy um, uh, through a single ministry works. I know there are skeptics about that, but I, you can understand why uh, people think that might be a good idea. Um, so you can line up diplomacy and aid, you know, together. Um, you know, and we'll see. Um, you know, I think time will tell. Um, I'm not sure I agree with your US decline issue. I mean, listen, Asia is booming. We know that, you know, of course it is. Um, but you know, if I if I had a dollar to invest today in the next ten years, I would invest it in the U.S. So, uh, um, you know, I, I and I think a lot of people would too. Um, I think there's quite a, a good question from Mark Newman about the Iran nuclear deal. I don't know if he's available to ask that.
If not, I'll, I'll just ask that for him. He's yes. asking if Biden should take a much stronger line on Iranian breaches of the JCPOA. <sighs> well, honestly, I'm not an expert on this, but my, my instinct is yes. Um, uh, I don't think the JCPOA, JCPOA was a great agreement. And I think the European signatories to that did everything they could to try and keep everyone on the same page. Um, but, you know, one of, the, one of the things that, like it or hate it, one of the things that Trump was good at, good at was pointing out where there were problems. And there were some real problems in that agreement. And, you know, it, it had, you know, had very little enforcement. Um, um, it had sunset clauses, which meant that, you know, whatever was agreed now could just be reversed in the future. So, you know, whilst in when he was campaigning for the presidency, uh, Biden said he would rejoin the JCPOA. I think that's very unlikely that he will do that. I just don't think he'd get, I don't think he'd get support in, in either house for doing that. So, um, my guess is that the heads are being scratched in the foreign office in the UK as well as to whether they want to stay on board with this thing now, because it sounds, and again, I'm not an expert, but it sounds like the breaches by Iran are getting very problematic. Um, and I think Andy Jennings has a question about Far East. Hi, right, good evening. Uh, just a question regarding the future activities, uh, I wouldn't call it belligerence, but the activities of China. Uh, do you see us moving hand in hand to lay military tripwires across the East China Sea with America, or do you see us staying sort of uh, you know Russian slash Estonia focused, allowing the uh, other members of Five Eyes, Five Eyes, who are better geographically located, uh, to to patrol the area? Well, I suppose yeah, I suppose there's a difference between virtual and physical patrolling, um, and I suspect the UK is very engaged in the kind of virtual patrolling through um, the monitoring of all the, all the communications and all that kind of stuff and uh, all the work that gets done at GCHQ and the other um, military intelligence places that the, U the UK is so good at. Um, honestly, I hope not on the, on the physical patrolling. Um, I, is, isn't, isn't the big, isn't our big aircraft carrier going to, um, East Asia next year. I think that's the plan. And uh, um, stuff I've read is that makes it a bit of a sitting duck, you know, from uh, it's kind of old technology. So um, I don't know. It's worrying, isn't it? That's probably a really worrying, the most worrying thing. I'm, I'm much less worried about North Korea than I am about, the, and I'm not that worried about Russia either, because I think, honestly, I think the chances of Russia ever. Um, you know, um, meaningfully encroaching into Western Europe is, uh, or the Central Europe are, are remote. Um, but, you know, China is a real problem. And uh, if China decided that once it's, once it's annexed Hong Kong, um, or, you know, stop the, uh, uh, one country, two systems in Hong Kong, and it might take a, another look at uh, Taiwan, and that would that would be a real issue. So I, I hope the answer is I hope not. <laughs> um, I think here we have a post Brexit trade question from Mike Harwood, if he's available to ask that. Yeah, hello, Duncan. It's a hello, rather mi it's a rather mischievous question. My my entire background's military. Okay. Um, so I'm very interested in your comments on the military side. We need a discussion offline about that. I've asked a mischievous question because one of the things that when you live in the US, when you work with the US, you're going to find anomalies. You're going to find things you don't like, uh, just like there are things you don't like about your own country. Right. Do we Brits need to get used to the idea of eating chlorinated chicken? <laughs> and are you prepared to do that if that was the uh, little thing you have to accept to get a trade, a so-called trade deal? Yeah, honestly, I, I, no, I, I think the chlorinated chicken, um, to mix my food analogies, is a real red herring. So the, the, the you know, obviously, it's nothing to do with food safety. I mean, Amer American chicken meat is 
delicious and it's perfectly safe and you know it about 10 percent of it at the mass end of the market so this is mass market chicken that is made into nuggets and things like that is is washed with a very dilute hardly any of it now chlorine but a dilute cleansing agent before it's sent to market in the same way that the spinach you buy in marks and spencer from from uh, spain is also washed with a similar kind of uh, mixed a cleansing agent by law in the UK in the in the EU, but this has been turned into a, a sort of a, a a big issue on what's really about protectionism and what the what the UK and Europe are doing are trying to protect their their own farming community and their own food production base and that and that's fine. Every country does that. The US does it too uh, in certain areas, but. On this particular issue, I think I think the UK is completely wrong. I, I I find it almost indefensible to put barriers up that make food for kind of normal people more expensive than it otherwise should be. And it, it's like the Corn Laws, you know, by by putting barriers up, and they're fake barriers as well. There's nothing wrong with the chicken. There's nothing wrong with GMO foods either. You know, why, you know, why would you not use technology to enhance the yield of a, of a crop? There's nothing wrong with it. And yet it, by, by blocking it from coming into the UK, it makes food prices higher than they otherwise would be. And for normal people where food, the food bill is an important component of their weekly um, expenditure, uh, I think that really matters. And yeah, for those people who want to go and buy organic chickens from Waitrose, good luck to you. You can do that. But for normal people, you know, I think let let the world compete. And we should, you know, it, if you believe in free trade, then there shouldn't be really exceptions. You know, let 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 the best producer at the best price uh, win. And yeah, food safety is a different issue, but there's nothing, there's nobody, nobody is accusing American growers of having unsafe products. So, I mean, this, I live here. I mean, it's the most litigious market in the world. You know, if, if the food was unsafe, people would be suing the farmers and suing the governments and, and they're not. So, in fact, the US thinks it's bizarre that you don't wash your products before they're sold because um, they're kind of focused on hygiene in the US in such a big way. Anyway, I, I, I know I'm in the minority, but uh, I, um, I, I just think we've got it back to front. Um, and I think Alex Kiriaki has a question, if you want to unmute. Yes, uh, hi. Um, yeah, my, my question was, um, will the um, Bidens um, We've lost you. Uh... Um, I'm so sorry. Um, can I can I still be heard? Yeah, 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 Alex, yeah. Just, just about, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. Hello. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if if Biden's um, decision to invest in the Iran nuclear agreement, that, you know, something that he already stated his with emphasis um, and his intention uh, that, that he intends to, to go back to, will catapult the nuclear race globally to the next level and will limit... Uh, his administration attention to other big issues, like, for example, um, collaboration with the UK on defence and, uh, and security. Well, maybe, but I, I, as I say, I, 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 although he said he would rejoin the the um, JCPOA, I, I think there's a, a lot of doubt about that. I, I think that we're we're in for an, a renegotiation if. If anything, we're in for a renegotiated agreement that is that, that resets the boundaries that Iran is allowed to um, reach in terms of its nuclear development. Because I think I think patience has run out in the U.S. not just under the Trump administration, but more broadly. And I think patience is running out in the U.K. 
Now, what happens with the, the, the other guarantors, I don't know. But I think if the UK joined the US and saying it's time to renegotiate, I think that uh, the Iran would have to renegotiate. So, or, or not, or they could go back to being, you know, under the, the full sanctions regime. There's a question from sure. Neil Dushak. I think I can see in the chat. Yes, hi there. Uh, well, thank you, Duncan. Thank you for such a really interesting talk. So, yeah, I was uh, wondering um, your, about your views on China and whether or not kind of the comparative diverging optic of the EU kind of seemingly getting closer to China with something like the Comprehensive Investments Agreement um, will be the main motor for a closer Anglo-American relationship when we think of uh, the more hawkish tone that Britain is taking on China over things like Huawei. I mean, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I think the, 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 the US was absolutely astonished by what the EU did. <laughs> Yeah, right at the time when Biden was was being inaugurated, the EU signed a deal, a trade a trade recognition agreement with China. Yeah, and I, and by the way, I don't think it's about I don't think it's just about these issues of trade. Um, I think it's about the human rights issues as well. Um, and you know, my my sense of it is that. Yeah, I suppose for understandable reasons the, the EU is trying to ride two horses. They're, 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 on the one hand, they want all the business, all the trade. They want to sell a lot of Volkswagens and, and handbags in, in China. And by the way, I, I spent 20 years visiting China you know, multiple times a year. So I know that market pretty well. And, um, you know, Europe did very well. I mean, some, some European firms did extremely well in, 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 in China for a period of time. But they're, they're kind of riding two horses. And I think the, the, the US is going to say, look, you know, you've got to decide on some of these issues. And I think that the UK probably already has decided. And, um, you know, um, I think the EU is going to be put under a great deal of pressure. So the answer to your question, I think, is yes. <laughs> That's Philip Blue. <laughs> I'm not sure I fully understand your question, Philip. <laughs> um, hi, Duncan. How are you? Yeah, I'm well. Um, yeah, I remember. I, I fondly remember um, those rugby sessions with John Pallant. And um, sorry to hear of Jeff's passing. Um, there's yes. a lot of, lot of chat in the UK about um, American healthcare companies coming over and getting big contracts for healthcare provision in the UK. So one of the big concerns of my somewhat paranoid colleagues is that um, the NHS is being sold off to big American healthcare providers, yeah. the HMOs. Um, yeah. Do you have any evidence of that? Do you think that might happen? It's a very interesting question. Of course, this was also a big, big part of the, along with food, uh, a big part of the kind of press coverage of a proposed trade agreement. And I, I think there's lots of issues that are being confused here. I mean, look, the first thing is, you know, the private companies providing services to the NHS has been in place now, you know, as for 30 years. I mean, it's been a very, very long time since every service that was provided inside the NHS was provided by a state-owned UK, UK state-owned entity. You know, in the you know, 30, 40 years ago, the yeah, the cleaning services were all state employees. Everything was a state employee. That changed. And already, I mean, for, for the last 20 years, there have been American companies providing services to the NHS, you know, including clinical services. So there are, there are yeah, hospitals which are subcontracted by the NHS, which are American owned. Uh, of course, all the a, a, you know, a lot of the drugs that are um, um, the kind of ethical pharmaceuticals, the prescription drugs and, and other drugs that are used and devices, you know, uh, medical devices are used in the NHS are provided by private American companies. So I think, I think, I mean, is anybody really saying that there shouldn't be any provision of by private companies of services or including clinical services inside the NHS? Maybe, but I, I think that would be slightly odd. 
The, the other issue about it's going to take over, you know, with some sort of American style system uh, of NHS. I don't think the US is remotely interested in that, in, uh, you know, in, in, in trying to get involved in how the UK provides its healthcare. They've got enough problems with their own healthcare system here. Um, I think the one issue that obviously has been talked about is drug pricing. Um, so, you know, you, large US pharmaceutical companies would like to be paid more for the drugs that they sell to the NHS. And NICE, as a sort of gatekeeper on what drugs are approved and the prices that are paid for them, they find frustrating. But that's just tough. You know, it's a single buyer market, you know, and that's just tough. If you want to sell drugs to the NHS, you've got to go through NICE and, you know, they're going to drive a hard bargain. So, um, you know, I, listen, I understand that there are people who are politically absolutely convinced that services, all services to the NHS should be provided by UK state owned entities and state employees. I'm not one of those people. I think that would be yeah, a disaster. I could, I could tell you weren't too concerned that I was one of them either, and I'm not. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah. I, I, I agree with you that it's, I think it's a bit of a non-issue, but I yeah. don't think that means it's an issue that's going to go away. No, I mean, because, because it's great it's fodder for the newspapers. It's great, it's Absolutely. great headline fodder. And yeah, it's like Franken foods and, you know, chicken and, you know, the, the, you know American healthcare comes to the UK everywhere because everyone thinks that's very alarming. And, uh, and by the way, you know, I'm not a huge fan of American healthcare system either. It's, uh, it's no, uh, I think, I think um, they've learned a lot from the NHS, actually. We are extraordinarily yeah. good value for money. Yeah, definitely. About half half the price and better outcomes. Um, uh, yeah. Absolutely. And, and equitable outcomes. Yes. Across yes. the country. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think Dipesh Patel had a very good one on China, if they're available to you. To, uh, well, just regarding the current situation with China, should we expect an alliance of free trading democracies including the USA and Japan, to protect global trading rules? Um, that would be great. You know, um, again, one of, one of the issues that the former president highlighted um, as being uncomfortable with and his team was the trading kind of um, supranational organization, the WTO. And, um, you yeah, know, that, that is that has become pretty much dysfunctional because uh, the appellate body, which is the kind of appeals body that reviews unfair trading cases, has to have a certain number of judges for it to be able to function. And the US has had a veto, has imposed a veto on any new judges. So it's not functioning at the moment. So um, look, I mean, it, Changing the international rules at the WTO is incredibly difficult because every single country has a veto. And so trying to get countries to agree that the rules should be changed uh, because the US is asking for it, um, it's just not gonna happen. And um, it'd be good to think that, you know, the US, Japan, the UK, maybe the EU could join together to say, suggest some new rules of the road for the WTO, but it would be seen as a rich country's club and you know, would immediately uh, be seen as a uh, kind of negative. So you've somehow or other, you've got to get the developing world uh, to uh, you know, buy into the fact that what was appropriate at the WTO 20 years ago needs to be re reformed. And I'm not very optimistic that that will happen in the short term. I think we'll end up with a crisis before any meaningful change in the WTO happens. I mean, and China cheats. We, I mean, China is constantly cheating in trade. You know, we know that. So, um, you yeah, know, it's, it's, it's a real problem, but it doesn't, it, you know, what are the sanctions? Uh, we have Hamish Stewart um, asking a question over whether you've, believe the US is a declining power? 
Uh, yeah, I suppose so. All from its peak, from its peak. <laughs> um, I think yes. I mean, the evidence of its, you know, of its decline in terms of its share of global GDP, uh, its share of military force, its share of cultural hegemony is definitely declined. You know. Um, you know, I think, by the way, and I think that latter one is, is just as important as the earlier two. Um, you know, um, the idea that kind of Hollywood holds sway when you've got, you know, these, these giant audiences for films coming out of Mumbai or giant, you know, huge film stars in China that, that you know, just dwarf any of the recognition for US um, or Western stars, I think that matters too. So yeah, I mean, look, I think from a, from a relative perspective, from its peak, it's definitely not as big a power uh, as it was, um, you know, but it's still the world's biggest uh, power militarily and uh, economically. Um, and if it chooses to re-engage, which I hope it will, um, you know, its ability to shape, you know, to define <laughs> as opposed to shape um, those supra national organizations is still there. Thanks, Duncan. I, <clears throat> I'm curious about the US, um, this kind of view of the US declining, because I, I, I think it's a long way off. But yeah, well, it's that's, relative, isn't it? From its peak. I mean, it still has the reserve currency. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to keep you too long. So I think if we finish off with a final question from Michael Ames about Chinese ownership of UK industry. Um, Michael Ames asks if Duncan believes Chinese major ownership of industries such as steel is likely to be a future UK US issue. Well, look, both the US and the UK, I mean, the, the, Everywhere, everywhere in the Western world, governments are uh, looking at their ability to, to review and block foreign ownership of important industries. And there's a major piece of legislation going through the UK at the moment, which people may not be aware of, which is probably more far reaching than uh, is happening uh, even in the US. The US has its CFIUS um, legislation, which allows it to look at any foreign, own uh, for any foreign transactions. I mean, honestly, I was a bit surprised by the extent to which Huawei was uh, uh, was was inside the UK telecoms. I was a bit surprised to the extent that it, people thought it was a good idea that the UK's nuclear uh, power generation capability was going to be managed by the Chinese. I, I, you know, honestly, I was a bit surprised by that. Um, you know, the, the UK's own intelligence agencies described Huawei as a high risk vendor. Um, so I was a bit surprised by that. So I think I think there's a there's likely to be a change in attitude. I'm yeah, not sure steel. Well, some some parts of the steel industry matter. I mean, stuff is, that's still made in Sheffield, you know, the super high end steels are you know, specialist steels that are used in defense still matter. Bulk steel, I'm not sure, is, is such a big issue. But the things like telecoms, oh, my God, um, nuclear power generation, I think these things need to be looked at very carefully. And um, I think that's exactly what the US was telling the UK, um, you know, when that, when that Huawei issue was being debated. I think, uh, um, I, I think they said, listen, guys, you've got to make a choice. And uh, in the end, the UK did. Well, I think it only remains to, to thank you, Duncan, on behalf of myself, Cardo and the audience for such a fascinating talk and for giving up your time to speak to us tonight. Um, I think with that, I'll hand over to Mrs. Bindloss. I really also just want to say thank you very much, Duncan. It's been a fascinating talk and it's been really busy on the chat and I hope that you've seen some of the lovely messages sent to say thank you. And I also want to say thank you very much to Dominic and Cardo for um, being amazing um, 
advocates for Merchant Taylor School and, and coping with lots of text messages from me in the background. It, it's been fantastic. So thank you so much. And uh, we hope to see it's you. It's been a pleasure, week. honestly. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. I, you know, and as I've said more often than I uh, would have wanted to this year, I wish we could have done this in person. But, yeah. uh, um, you know, this worked pretty well. So thank you very much indeed uh, for having me. And uh, thanks again. Thanks to Dominic and Cardo. You did a great job. So Brilliant. Thank you. And it's great to see everybody. We look forward to yeah, seeing you on another MTS Together talk. Right. Look forward to Thank Bye. you. Bye.